Hey, I'm Eric O'Keach with fitnessbusinessinterviews.com, and today I've got Mr. Brian Grosso with me. And as a lot of you know, Brian was the former CEO of the IYCA, the International Youth Conditioning Association, but now he's moved on to a different project called the Free Thinking Renegade. Brian's here today to talk about something that he's done really well with each one of these businesses, and that is creating a community. And not just any community, a community of raving fans. Now, obviously, a successful fitness business or any business needs revenue to survive, but to generate a lot of that revenue, a business needs a community that will live and breathe everything it does. And Brian's going to share the secrets on how to build this community. And at the end of this interview, Brian's going to reveal the number one tip you can do to start building this community as fast as possible. Brian, thanks so much awesome. for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to this. I hope I come up with some nuggets that are worthwhile for your listeners, man. Absolutely. We'll have something. I know you'll definitely have something good for us. So, all right. So first question, I'm going to dive right into it. You know, you were, you were there at the IYCA for years. You Now you've moved on to the FTR, able yeah. to build this community, these, these fans, things like that. I just, how are you able to do that? Uh, yeah, great question. I think uh, I'm going to try and stay away from the cliches on this one. The, the cliches everyone knows, but very few actually in that. I think one of the issues, uh, Eric, is to understand the psychology of not just consumers, but people at large. And, you know, we talked about these nuggets, I hope to, uh, you know, espouse and maybe even the greatest secret at the end of the interview. But I think if I were to come up with a, with a home run shot now, it's people need to understand, and when I say people, business owners need to understand that one of the driving motivating factors, perhaps the biggest motivating factor, and I, I, I you know, will spend more time explaining this as the interview goes on, um, is that people, consumers, want to be part of something bigger than themselves. That's a massive psychological driver for, for consumers. And, and when I say that, it's, it, we, we've got to get out of the mentality of just trading time for money, or products for money, or services for money. And there's a variety of reasons for that. So, I mean, you cut me off if I get too long-winded, but, you know, it's a, one of the things I, I often talk about is the whole um, billboard mentality. Uh, there was a time that investing heavily, because they are expensive, into billboard-type ads. If you were the, the type of company that had a certain amount of revenue that could afford that, uh, it was a worthwhile investment because, you know, you guaranteed yourself a lot of eyes if you're, you know, a billboard on a highway. But... Over time, we learn more about market demographics, consumerism, habits, psychology, but also societal influences change. So now if you're driving on the highway, you're going to see a litter of billboards. And the number of eyes who attach themselves or come into contact with your message is not really a big factor anymore insofar as successful business ownership, management, revenue-based enhancers, et cetera. It's the whole conversion reality. So just getting prominence out there really doesn't hit the psychological overtures of what consumers are motivated by anymore. But now they're just advertising. And for a different reason, uh, well, I shouldn't say that, a, a, a bit of a simile of a reason. When I think about the fitness community, I think about, and I hate to say it so bluntly, but Eric, I think about lemmings. I think about someone orchestrated this reality called CrossFit. Excellent idea. I'm not here to champion it, nor to you know be be a maligner towards what I think about the content or the the training overtures or otherwise. But I am going to talk about the concept. It's new. It's it's refreshing. There was something very vibrant about it, and it it, it took hold. Same with boot camps. Same with a lot of things that become trends and fads in the fitness industry. But at some point, we hit a saturation level where how are you distinguished? in the eyes of the consumer from the personal trainer down the street, the CrossFit location down the street, the boot camp owner around the corner, fitness professionals need to think like consumers. What is the differentiating factor as to why someone would pick up your phone number or walk into your facility or enter into your boot camp, whatever you know venue you happen to hold your fitness um, experience through? And I think the last word I use there is experience. Now, if you don't think like a consumer, you kind of assume that my certifications hold water and all this education and peripheral uh, education I've done over the years, be it certifications, uh, continuing ed, degrees, masters, uh, graduated, uh, pardon me, post-graduation, um, diplomas and degrees, etc. 
somehow mean something to the consumers. And let me be the first one to say they don't. Now, I owned an educational entity. So, of course, I'm not going to belittle education. I think education is something that starts at birth and it should only ever stop after you take, you know, before you take your last breath. I think education, self education or formal education is something that's a pursuit ongoing forever in life. But we can't assume that a, a consumer understands that my certifications, my requisite education, somehow makes me a better option than training down the street. But what does make me a better option is if I provide an experience that is unique, that has a differentiating factor, that is different in every way than somebody else's. Now, good stuff, right? But having said that, we kind of gravitate in the fitness industry to the standard differentiations, the most notable being price. We start to undercut, two weeks free, one month, uh, no payments. Uh, you know, one of those models called Eric there, the, um, the forced continuities, yeah. all great things. And I love them all and I've used them all, but then the differentiation we're going for ends up being the same as everybody else. Free thinking renegadism, which, you know, I'm not here to promote my company, but the whole concept of thinking like a free thinking renegade is that you are prepared to imagine true difference and then lead a charge down a different path of which you become the originator of. Don't worry about competitive minded spirits. Whereas if, if your idea catches on, there's going to be a thousand fitness pros who copy it. That's great. You can forever and, and, and forever and always hold on to the tag of you were the first and being the first in terms of market differentiation is a massively important part of revenue success. But what kind of experience can you give your boot campers, your CrossFitters, your personal training clients they can't get other places that isn't just embedded in the training itself? Can you create a community that there is pride to belong to? Can you create a community that has social awareness ties to it? That the reality of being part of your fitness business is that you do things with and for other boot campers, other fitness participants who are involved in that company for the community at large or nationalistically. You donate to charities. You, 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 you give you know, clothing away to goodwill. Once a month, the entire boot camp nation you're a part of does some kind of charitable event. Do things that matter. That's what the world needs. But it's also, statistically speaking, what we know to be true from 30 years of research that compels people to want to be part of something is that they're doing things that matter. So I'm, I'm being, I think, a little long winded. I hope some of that made sense. But what can your differentiating factors be that beget a community development, not just a series of clients with whom you have strategies to upsell, to create referral networks, all great stuff, but antiquated in the development of business in the 21st century. All right. So basically getting back to, I mean, really one of the things, the key things to developing that community is the experience and being different. Mm -hmm. to sum it up. So like if you can be different sure. and you can create that experience, that's going to automatically help to create a community where then you can promote that change and all of the things that you mentioned, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I want to be, Again, I don't want to be ambiguous. The, the statistics have shown that the sense of belonging to a community, to, to matter to a community, to be part of something bigger, is the single greatest factor that relates to happiness, that people feel happy. Happy consumers don't walk away. Uh, happy consumers are not basing their ability to open their wallets and continue being clients of yours on the sole fact of they got the results you promised them in the mm -hmm. way of weight loss, fat loss, etc. They want to be part of the community you've created because they feel happy being a part of that. It's something bigger than fitness, something bigger than themselves. That's the challenge. Differentiation doesn't have to be, you know, shoot the moon and, and you know, all kinds of crazy weird stuff, but it can be social responsibility to do things that matter more than just the X's and O's of fitness and training, fat loss, et cetera. Why exactly do you think that people really want to be a part of community, to be part of something? Ah, that's a great question. The psychological part of that, I think, is really 
I mean, it's so interesting. It's something I want to learn more about myself. I, 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 I was, I read the research and I've investigated it a great deal. And I keep coming back to the centralized theme that proportionally speaking, the happiest com- uh, countries in the world with the happiest per capita populations are not countries you expect. They're not thriving developed nations like the United States, Canada, Great Britain. Top of the list is Nigeria, Mexico, Nicaragua, countries that are third world based, are, are, are poverty stricken. You know, Nigeria, for example, has a, a GDP of like $800 annually. So the average, the average household income is services have a different relative cost than they do here, perhaps in the United States or Canada. But um, that's still a significant noticeable factor that people don't have expendable cash. They're living in poverty and yet they're happier than we are. And the reason that they've shown is that the case is that they belong, they feel belonging to a community. And I think to answer your question more astutely there, Eric, I think people feel that they want to matter. And I, I believe there are a lot of introverts, a lot of extroverts, and a lot of hybrids. I, I believe myself to be a hybrid of those two in the world who might not know how to create a difference or feel as though they're creating a difference in the world to not know or not believe they have the greatness inside them to actually create that difference, but actually adore being part of a community where they feel as though they matter to other people in that community. I think that has a huge psychological impact on why community involvement is so proportionally specific to happiness. So you would think that, or you're saying maybe in terms of, let's say a training business, the fact that they feel like they matter Mm. is more important to them than maybe actually getting the results or doing what they need to do to achieve what they want? Yeah. I think a lot of fitness trainers will disagree and that's okay. I'm, I'm not, I don't, you know, I don't, I, I espouse what I espouse, believe what I believe, but love to articulate what everyone else believes or listen to what everyone else believes as well. But I think if we were to stop and we were to look in the mirror and we were to actually reduce this away from the marketing bonanza that the fitness industry has come to, I think what we have to appreciate is that if we were really good as an industry, what we were doing, the overweight obesity epidemic wouldn't continue to, continue to spiral upwards. I think the industry at large, no one person in particular at all has done a miscalculation in that we think the psychological reasons people want to be fit is the concerns of health, the aesthetic realities of overweight, over fat. I do think that plays a role. But it, it's, it's not a visceral thing. I think the visceral reality of it all is that if we were to build fitness companies based on community development, senses of belonging, the results would take care of themselves. And they would become of secondary importance to our, our, our clients and participants at large. These are not dissimilar at all from the virtues I created within the IYCA a community of people working towards a common task. Of course, we tended to the X's and the O's of youth athlete development and speed and agility, you know, differentiations as ages chronologically increased. I mean, we did all that good, hard scientific realities of training. But one of the most important things we did in the IYCA, I believe, was the art of coaching, the how-tos communicate, the how-tos uh, relate to introverts versus extroverts. We taught coaches and really empowered them to take any child who came into their, into their program and make them feel part of the community. That is part of why the IYC exploded, in my opinion. And um, results, the perception that we carry that results are the most important factor, I believe we are mistaken 100%. Um, I, I, I believe that so much that I can't stop talking about it. And I hope more fitness professionals realize that in the virtues of helping people, changing society, but also building revenue-rich businesses for themselves. You mentioned uh, CrossFit before. Now, regardless mm-hmm. of whether people think you know it's a good thing or a bad thing, you can't argue with the fact that they have one hell of a community. Yes. What is it that you think that they do or that they're doing that is just helping to create that massive community that people are literally like, will fight to the death for those guys? Yeah, you know, they, I don't know if you saw this. I believe it's coming. I believe it's actually coming out today, March twentieth. I saw it as a uh, prelude on social media that they were doing this. Uh, a rabid CrossFit, I believe, member who happens to be a PhD in psychology, just wrote a book called "The Power of Community." 
okay. the CrossFit experience. It's coming out either today or tomorrow, I believe. And I want to read it just because I'm so enthralled with the idea of creating communities. And of course, that's right up my alley. But I think w they do so many things right. The rest of the fitness industry kind of marginalizes CrossFit to a great deal based solely on the argument of training tactics. We debate if CrossFit's safe, if it's good, if it works, if it's real. They don't engage in that debate a lot, though. I mean, some of them do, and of course, when you're that big, you can't control every moving part. So sometimes the debate comes from this side, and it's fostered by that side. But have you ever noticed CrossFitters don't really spend a great deal of time necessarily arguing the training methodologies? And again, I want to preface, some do. But the majority of CrossFitters, I, and I, I like what they do. They, they almost laugh outwardly at the people who are being negative towards them, as if there's an exclusivity to being part of CrossFit that, Eric, you wouldn't get unless you were part of us. And that is what they do so well. It's a we mentality. It's an us mentality. How do you think and, they do that, though? Like how, I'm trying to dive in. Like How do they do it? What would you think is one of the ways that they do it? So, so little things like clothing, small things. I mean, the CrossFitters are, they're compelled to wear the flag colors. That's one little thing. But I think the challenges, the challenges always struck me as something amazing. On, on the website, it used to, I, I don't know what it is anymore. I don't investigate much. It used to be that once a week, the CrossFit executive would put a CrossFit challenge of the week that inspired people to do this workout routine and it was always nauseating and vomit provoking but there was a sense of accomplishment and belonging to get through it but the one thing they did on that stuff that was so great upload your videos of you just finishing this workout or doing this workout to this crossfit.com backslash march 2012 and i i'm just I, i'm not i'm just kind of spouting out i don't really know how they did it but that's they 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 got you excited about being part of them by taking on their challenges, by doing extraordinary things, then documenting it and showing everybody else. It became viral. It became a badge of honor to be part of that community. So again, I'm not here to champion cross, but I have nothing to do with them at all, but I admire how they created a community. Very right. much I admire that. Right. And you, and you can't, you know, you can't neglect that. That's one thing they do really well. And, um, I think it's very similar. You talked about experience before, and you just mentioned that they're, you know, the challenges. Mm -hmm. I guess part of the community thing is they go through it together. Like they're reaching yes. a goal and they're doing it together. Um, yeah. Talk, talk about that a little bit in terms of like kind of overcoming obstacles and maybe how that, if, if everybody's involved in overcoming certain obstacles, how that plays a role in, in developing that community. Great question. I think this speaks to the heartbeat yeah. of even more specificity with respect to my thoughts on fitness pros building successful uh, fitness communities. Communities, not businesses. Um, I think we have to appreciate psychology more than we do. I think we have to appreciate uh, inspiration versus motivation more than we do. I think we have to understand socialization, conditioning, and influences more than we do. And I think it, it's very easy to get people excited about things like, I guarantee you'll lose 10 pounds in 10 weeks, because it's, a, it's an ostensible thing. It's an exterior thing. And there's two very different – massive distinguishing factors. Motivation is extrinsic. It comes from an outside source, but man, when you're inspired, it's visceral. It's inside. Something turned a switch on, and now you're rabid to do that and make it yours, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think in the interest of building that community, like you said, shared experience, I think that not just the session, becoming a better coach and communicator, understanding high motivation and high skill versus low motivation, high skill, and all the intricacies I talked about in my, in my tenure with the IYCA, the coaching experiences. But what about outside the sessions? What do fitness pros do outside the sessions to congregate their community? Be it on Facebook. Have a, a specific group-only page where you can talk to your clients. They can talk to each other. Connect the tribe. What about offline, once a month having meet and greets at the local Starbucks coffee shop at your house, open your doors, get your clients to come, provide ways they can connect with each other and share their experience of being in your care. Um, but, but more than that, and I mean, this is an important part when I talk about the psychology, not just to get together to have healthy cooking demonstrations, 
or eat healthy foods and break bread. That's important stuff. But you know what? One of the preventative, many of the preventative factors that per, that stop or inhibit clients, your clients, my clients, when I was in the fitness industry, from achieving their goals are things like vulnerability. There are deep-rooted psychological reasons people overeat. There are deep-rooted psychological uh, psychological reasons people resist exercise. And I say that because. We are creatures of movement. The human body has been made to move. It's in our DNA to be active. So our society, which is currently over fat and very inactive, we are overcoming centuries of encoding at the DNA level to arrive where we are right now, which is apathetic and, and lethargic towards activity and to consume foods that we can't process let alone use properly in our bodies. We're overcoming DNA to arrive where we are now. And we really think that strategizing a well-placed marketing ad, a billboard, or talking about 10 pounds in 10 weeks is going to inspire people. We have to get to vulnerability. Why are we psychologically inhibited from embracing the lifestyle that genetically is one we should be embracing and are actually overturning centuries of DNA to not embrace. Have you ever talked to your clients about honest to gosh, purpose, passion, vulnerability, their fears? But this, Eric, is not a one conversation thing. This is not a you having a conversation with me where I say, what are you afraid of, buddy? And we talk at the very exterior layer because right. – we have not established the relationship yet where you or I feel open to sharing with each other. But if you build that in as part of your fitness community, there should be tears. There should be laughter. There should be emotion as part of this journey you want your clients to go on. That is going to embed them into wanting to become more and more involved with the community because now we're helping them remove the layers of what their inhibiting factors are. We're seeing results, but not because we have the next great super secret system for training or because my boot camp is better than the guys down the street, but because we do one thing better than anybody else, we care. And we show that care and we, we allow a bridging and a fostering of that care to come into our community outside of just sets and reps. All right now, do you think that, <laughs> I mean, that that's even applicable, let's say in physical marketing, you're talking about the billboards before, you know, you, I, I just think that if you started pasting things like that on a billboard, people would be like, yeah, I don't want any part of that. You know, yes. like they kind of have to use that 10 pounds in 10 weeks example like you use to get them in the door. And then once they're in, then they have to build it. Is that, would you agree or disagree with that? I don't think I agree or disagree. I think perhaps it's, it's a combination of both. To say I'm against marketing is silly because um, I believe in marketing. I just believe in doing it well as opposed to lazy. Um, I've always and long considered this to be true. When you do for your community and show you willingness to do for your community, they will do for you. In that, if we want to call it referral networks, we can. I have no problem with that. But in that, I've always found the greatest source of new client enrollment, be it to an organization like the IYCA or a local training center, is to ask your current family members inside of your community to help with the process of bringing on more family members. Be that they simply get you referral contacts and you connect. They bring friends and family and neighbors and other colleagues with them to training sessions. But I love the whole reality of the family inwardly grows the family. I think you can't beat that. And I think <clears throat> marketing is often a, a question of time versus money. Billboards cost money. Referral networking costs time. I would rather spend my time showing my community I care enough to ask for their input and their help, but not just leaving it at their feet, Eric. Hey, could you bring me two new clients? If you do, I'll give you a month for free. The month for free never inspires nearly as much as you showing you care wholly about them bringing more people to you. So, again, in the time versus money equation, I would rather spend time and have my current family inwardly grow a new, bigger family. One of the other things is, you know, people can create this community. 
but you need to develop the, a culture with <laughs> it too. Yes, well said. Can you kind of break down what the difference is, you know, between actual community and what the culture is within the community? Great question. I think that leads to something you and I talked about yesterday, just on the phone and preparing, you know, to talk about the things today is um, I think that fitness pros have to check their purpose. I really do because um, I don't believe every fitness professional in the world is in this for the right reasons. It, you know, and I'm not, I'm not casting judgments, but this is a lifestyle owning a fitness company of any kind. It is something that has to be a purpose driven reality in your world, in your brain, in your soul. And so you have to be your culture, not just espouse it, not just set expectations. Although I think that's a big part of it. Let me touch on that in a second. But this is, this must be considered broader than just a business you're creating for the purpose of having a career and paying your bills. This is altering lives, which is, the very essence of what a purpose-driven life is about. So I think, A, you have to be the culture you want to see in your community. But B, and I already touched on it, creating a culture in my brain has always been about indoctrinating your community into a level of expectation and holding yourself accountable for that expectation as well. And I don't mean just a nicely decorative PDF that you give to people or it shows up on your website, but it, it is constantly talked about. The 10 tenets of belonging to Eric Rokish's fitness community are, and then you fill in what you feel is most important about the culture you want to create. But it can't stop there. Every session, it's talked about. Every session, we remind each other why we're here, what we're doing, what the tenants are. You don't have to call them tenants. You don't have to call them parables. It, you know, but it doesn't have to be so formal. But it certainly is. The mistake I think that happens is that we try to create these cultures by just landmarking a mission statement, putting it on our website, and that's it. It has to be a living, breathing document that we live, espouse, talk with, communicate about, and ask for feedback from our community at all times. Okay. Now, we've been kind of going through this theme a little bit through here, and you talked about it a little bit in detail early on in the interview, but when we spoke yesterday, you said there was something that kind of stuck with me, and I wrote it down. I'll read it back to you. Uh, I kind of want to get your thoughts a little bit more on it. And it was, you said, the, the lack of knowing what it is is less important to our consumers than how it feels to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Now, if people don't understand something, are they really going to want to be a part of it? Well, that goes back to the initial question, or not the initial question, but one of the questions you asked uh, a couple ago. That's why I, I'm a, my biggest reverence of marketing is always towards inside out growth. That yeah. your best billboard is your client who can passionately talk to his coworkers, her family, her coworkers about her experiences of being part of your community. You know, in an office setting, a family setting, a neighborhood setting, I'd be willing to bet you could find several examples, if we were to talk about this, of different moms, different dads talking to their neighbors or colleagues saying, my trainer's the best, I lost 20 pounds. My trainer's the best, I lost three dress sizes. My trainer's the best, right. blah, 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 blah. But who will stand up and say, my trainer is the best, and then passionately explain what it feels like to be part of your community? That's, you're right. I get it. And I understand they don't know what it feels like. So how do you market? That's why I'm such a fan of inside out growth. Okay. Let's uh, give an example here. Kind of if someone is just starting out, let's say with their own training business or something, what are some of the things that they can do early on to start building that community? Yes, create your culture, meaning on paper. Decide for yourself what the culture needs to be. Um, before you start X and Oing and, and, you know, I'm assuming you've got your training methodology at this point down. Of course, this can be dynamic. You're going to learn more and do more. But what's your culture going to be? What kind of clients do you want? I believe the fact that like attracts like. Um, the number of – because I'm still so connected to the fitness community on Facebook, Eric, I, the number of – things down my newsfeed of trainers kind of bitching about their clients, I think to myself, 
I've never had a client I didn't like because I always started off by kind of organizing the expectations I had for my clients, for myself, for the culture of my, of my business, my community. So start there. What is important to you culturally that you want to build in this community? That's number one. Number two, Seth Godin calls them sneezers. Sneezers are essentially your most rabid fans. They're the people who live and breathe and die by what it is you're doing. They just absolutely adore it. And they are already the people who understand and feel it more than see it. Talk to them. Say, look at Eric. You know, you get this. You understand. You live the culture. We need to build this culture. We need to do good things from here in Montreal where I live. We need more people. Sit and brainstorm with them. Take them out for dinner and ask them ideas of how we can get, how can we work together to get more people involved in our community. Sneezers, as Seth Godin defines them, are the people who will most assuredly and rapidly promote your stuff if so asked to do so. So number one, create the culture you want. Number two, select your sneezers, identify them, and then bring them into your circle and ask for their help, ask for their ideas, and then get on a crusade, all of you, to build more inward out growth into your community. Okay, and wrap up last few questions here for you. What are some of the mistakes or biggest mistakes you see when someone is out there trying to build a community? Uh, I think they don't get community centric, they get business centric. And I know, it, like, gosh, IYC is a business, FTR Nation's a business, I get business. But I think internally calling it a community changes your opinion of what it is you're doing. And that's, I, I know it might sound contrite, but it's its so powerful in my head. The words we choose to use are, are powerful in our brains in terms of how we act on what we think. So stop calling your fitness business a business and start calling the community. That in and of itself will change the way you try to build it. So that right there is one. The other biggest mistake I think people make is um, they, they – I suppose they don't embrace the true purpose it requires to build a community. It's, it, this is not a career. This is something larger than that. And I think the the notion of emotionality and visceral that I'm talking about, you espousing your clients, you have to feel that yourself. You have to feel so proud to be a part of building this community. So if you don't feel that, I mean, that's okay. But then that's you're not who I'm talking to necessarily. Right. And I think there are a lot of fitness pros, Eric, who, who, who do understand and are so passionate and purpose-driven about this stuff. And I hope what we're talking about today matters to them. Absolutely. Now, we've talked about it throughout this, the theme, but if you were to wrap it up and have it kind of put this whole community-based conversation into like one final sentence or one tip for everybody, what would that be? Do something that matters. I don't mean to, to, to parse off of, uh, I forget the guy's name, he created Tom's Shoes, a really nice, you know, good organization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he created a documentary called Do Something That Matters, so I'm not trying to steal off of him. I was just inspired by it, and the simplicity of those words are perfect. Do something that matters. And, you know, it doesn't have to be like, I'm not saying get your clients to ante up more money so that you guys can write a check to a charity as a group. I mean, your community not your fitness community, but your, where you live needs help. The school could use something. The, the parks association could use something. Do stuff that matters. Dream a little. Think outside the box. Think of the impossible and start to use that as a business model where you're not just bringing your clients in for fitness purposes, but you're bringing them into a community where your community does things together as a group for the benefit of your country, the world, or your local geographic area. That would be my one summary is do stuff that matters and watch as people start to navigate and flock towards that. Very cool, Brian. Well, I appreciate you coming on. A very interesting conversation about community and culture. Uh, for people who want to know more about you and what you're doing now, where can they go? Uh, you know, freethinkingrenegades.com. That's our blog. It's where I, you know we post three times a week uh, some of our artistic videos, some of my words, etc. Just give us a look and see what kind of flavor uh, we're offering. Cool, Brian. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. My honor. Thank you.